The following episode of Bread for the People is brought to you by Side Hustle Bread, Long Island's handcrafted artisanal bread company. Side Hustle Bread is a family-run virtual bakery that's bringing the neighborhood feel back to Long Island one loaf at a time. Head on over to SideHustleBread.com for more information, upcoming appearances, and merchandise. My name's Jim Serpico, and this... Should I start with my name? Or should I start with this is Bread for the People? Do you like it like this? Welcome to Bread... Or do you like it like this? Welcome. Ready? Welcome to Bread for the People. Mind... Fuck. Is there a script? Welcome to Bread for the People. My name's Jim Serpico. Today, we're here with Emily Schilt. She's a writer, a brand builder, and the founder of Pop-Up Grocer, a traveling grocery store dedicated to discovery. Not only does Pop-Up Grocer set up for 30 days at a time in cities around the United States, but rumor has it, Emily is opening her first, I might be wrong about this, permanent location in New York City. Emily, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, and um, thank you for... Thank you for calling me a writer. I haven't, I haven't written anything in a long time, such as uh, life as a small business owner. <laughs> yeah, but did you like writing? I liked. I love writing. Yeah, you just have to have like a pretty rich inner. You love writing. I love writing, but you have to have a pretty rich inner life um, to write something, and I, I no longer uh, have that. <laughs> I just think about groceries all the time. So I guess there's a forthcoming grocery book to be written. I hear that. I, I write for television and I develop shows and I, I talk about this once in a while. I do carve out time to live a semi-normal life. And sometimes I think it's been an advantage to me to be somebody who writes for Hollywood, but living in the suburbs of Long Island. So it's not even Manhattan. There aren't a ton of people in show business where I've lived my entire life. And I draw from that. I think it's cool. So I do relate to what you're saying, but maybe you could write a, a workplace something or other. I'm sure there's some writing in you. Yeah, or, you know, seasons of life. The, the, time, the time to do so will present itself when it, it's supposed to. I promise I won't be woo-woo the whole time with that. <laughs> <laughs> I am in New York, not, not in LA. Yeah, man. So... Let's, I guess, let's start with Pop-Up Grocer. Is it true you're opening up a store in Manhattan? God willing, yeah. If all goes right with the construction, which it so rarely does, right? Yeah. But yes, uh, it's happening. Not exactly willing to commit to win, but it's happening. Do you mind explaining to us what the concept of Pop-Up Grocer is? Sure. So we are the destination to discover new grocery items. We historically, over the last three years, have traveled city to city, opening for 30 days at a time and featuring somewhere around 150 emerging brands and somewhere around 400 new better for you products exclusively. So the items you'll find in our stores are not a uh, heritage brand that you would find in any convenience store or any typical grocery store. They're new to market exclusively. So we're in effect advertising for them. And we've opened nine pop-ups across seven cities at this point, I think, including a couple doses of New York City, other cities like LA, Austin, Chicago. We're in Denver now. We'll close there pretty soon. And then, yeah, our 10th store is embarking upon a permanent location, which will represent the same idea, the same concept, just in a longstanding, reliable destination here in, in New York City. I'm fascinated by a lot of things about Pop-Up Grocer. If you don't mind, I'm curious about the logistics because your design of these stores are pretty amazing and they're pretty consistent. 
So if we start with the, the real estate portion, I'm also I'm asking some of this as, as for selfish interest, right? I don't know if you know anything about me at all, but I also have a bread company and I do a lot of farmer's markets. I pop up in breweries and we're trying to brand ourselves as Long Island small batch handcrafted bread. I have a personal story that I like to tell. And I've looked into retail and it scares the shit out of me, to be honest with you. And I also don't know if I want, I, I do want to do something bigger with my company, but I don't know if I want to be a slave to the, at least selling loaves of retail bread. And I've always thought of the idea of popping up somewhere and I've made some calls and nobody ever wants to talk to me. Like they, they're interested in long-term leases they're sniffing out the business to see if it's going to be successful and if you could actually pay the rent for five years. That's been my experience. And then you see the only other pop-ups I know of in, in a bigger way are like these Christmas stores, Halloween shops, and they must be throwing down some serious money and they've been around. So these people are happy to have them come in and they're moving so much product, right? So it might make sense for them to overpay for a month. How did you figure out how to do this at the beginning? And how do you get into a place? Yeah, rich question. <laughs> First of all, I think that the pop-up Halloween stores and Christmas shops are truly fascinating. And they might have figured out like the secret to life. <laughs> because if you can just have a, a seasonal business like that and have it be, uh, generate that kind of revenue, that probably allows you to live a pretty, uh, pretty have a pretty good quality of life. But... To answer your question about how we find and secure vacancies, well, first of all, I'll say maybe this will be the title of my book. You know, I think naivete is the most important aspect of starting your own business. 100% agree. I never would have done any of this if I had any idea what I was doing. Agreed. Nobody in their right mind would sign up for what you have to sign up to do. Uh, By the way, to, for, I say the same thing. Run a business. The, um, the same thing about my bread company. Yeah. Which has, for a while, took over my entire home, uh, took over my entire family's life, fractured our relationships temporarily. But I, I'm happy yeah. we did it. They're happy we did it. But yeah, if I knew all the stuff going in, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, before I started Pop Up Grocer, I had several concepts. And one that I was pretty far along on putting the strategy together for was a fast casual restaurant. And a mentor like very simply asked me if I would be willing to wear a hairnet. Like I would I be willing to wear do all of the jobs in the beginning required to run a successful USR? And I said yes to most. And then when she got to the question, where it's like, would you be willing to wear a hairnet? That's where I drew the line. I was like, no, I can't see myself doing that. Um, <laughs> so uh, I didn't pursue that business. But so I would also say, like, just don't at yet. Don't ask yourself any of the questions. Don't ask anyone in the industry. Just like get in and, and start doing it or else you'll be too, too scared. But we secure 45, 45 to 50 day leases. So they're very short. I mean, even in the example of like the Halloween store, it's probably, I don't know, three months, please, something like that. So it's quite unique. I think we have been fortunate in the somewhat unfortunate landscape of now in that like when we started in 2019, New York, we, and we started in New York, the rents here were just so exorbitantly high, no one could afford them. And landlords are kind of uniquely in the way that the system is set up here, willing to sit on vacancies for a really long time until they get the ideal long-term tenant that they're seeking. So they actually are interested in just filling it for like a very short bit of time, which is what we're looking for. But then now there are a lot more vacancies sort of all over the country as a result of, of generally what's happened in retail and the changing landscape of retail and kind of landlords slowness to catch up to all of that. So yeah, it's kind of a, but kind of fortuitous timing. And it is a lot of work. You know, we build a fully functioning store in like 10 days. And, you know, we turn a white box into something that's very joyful and aesthetically pleasing and exciting to enter. 
and that is not without a lot of sweat and very little cash up front. So, <laughs> so you are are you building this? Do you have carpenters and you you're bringing in wood and you're building these cabinets so that they look similar and then you're painting them white and bringing in your signs? All of the above. Yeah. So we travel the country with our large fixtures, the fridges and freezers, the shelving, like kind of on an annual basis, we'll reconstruct the shelving, but we will travel with it for a year. We store it in the city where we close and then we truck it over to the city next city where we're opening. So it is a logistically heavy operation. You're renting trucks as you need them. You don't have a pop-up grocer trailer, do you? We don't, but we do consistently work with one storage and trucking company. I like it. I like, I, I mean, it's fascinating to me. It's, it's pretty groundbreaking. I've never heard anything like this other than those two things we mentioned, but it's not food related. And you mentioned your advertising for these new brands, which I can also relate to. But what does that mean? Are you a media company? And what are you, what are you telling these people? Let's say I had a non-perishable chip that was packaged very nicely and I wanted to present to you, which I don't. <laughs> but if I did, you know, what, what do you tell people like me we get? So the value proposition for Pop-Up Grocer is exposure and visibility to a meaningful audience that can have real impact on the early stage of your business. So we have early adopter consumers, we have content creators and influencers, we have buyers who are looking at what we do, regional and national retailers, investors, kind of all the key stakeholders to help you get off the ground and get discovered. So we really position our use of physical spaces and the access to our audience the same way that you would if you were operating a newsletter among tastemakers or a conference or, you know, if you were an influencer asking to be paid for a post to reach whoever, you know, your followers. So that's kind of like what we guarantee is exposure. And then what comes of that exposure is out of our hands, but is certainly well within the realm of possibility. So a lot of the brands that we work with have gone on to, you know, garner national media, have major hits in, in the press. They've gone on to partner with a regional or national chain like Whole Foods or something even bigger than that. So we kind of promise exposure to our audience and then communicate that beyond that, a uh, world of opportunity. Got it. We're at a time where a lot of people, especially from COVID, uh, a little before COVID, but especially with COVID, people started moving to purchasing groceries online and you're going in the opposite direction. Do you find that a struggle and an obstacle to overcome? And if so, how do you do it? Yeah. I mean, again, we're like advertiser first retailer second. So really look at the ability to sell in our space as a bonus. Um, and a lot of brands do. I don't mean to misconstrue that either. A lot of brands do move a, a lot of product significantly more, some 10, 15 X than what they would in another retailer. I've been in marketing for the entirety of my career. I'm in the CPG food and beverage space. So I'm watching the pendulum swing. When I started, social media was new. Being online was very novel. That was really exciting for brands. And that was really exciting for consumers to be able to engage with brands in that way, to be able to buy directly from those that they had uh, grown an affinity for through their website, you know, D to C. And then, you know, even just so much over the last two years where we've all were stuck at home and the online behavior became overwhelming and I think we're quite fatigued by it. So the offline is now 
what is novel. And I think we really always saw that coming and forecasted that. I mean, my thesis since starting the business has been that with the sort of ubiquity of online shopping, I can get my staples at the click of a button on Amazon or wherever my preferred destination is, probably from a cost standpoint as my primary interest. And then I want to go to the physical store, have a human interaction with the staff there, have an experience for things that are fun and maybe not necessities, but for that discovery experience. Now, your background is in brand building and consulting. Is that right? Yes. Consulting on brand building. Consulting on brand building. Yeah. You've worked with brands like Kind Snacks, Chobani, a fast casual restaurant I used to go to when I had an office in Soho or NoHo called Dig In. Are they trying to build experiences? And are they marketing companies that happen to serve products? Yes. I mean, Dig In, for example, or a fast casual restaurant certainly has the advantage of actually having a physical space in which to create an experience. Products are really at, uh, they're beholden to the retailer. So that's where we come in and where my light bulb really went off in my experience working with launching products is that most of the grocery retailers out there are not focused at all on creating an experience. They actually make it as difficult as possible to shop, to enjoy shopping. It's time intensive. The healthier products are on the tippy top or the bitty bottom because they're not paying for the slotting that's required to be at eye level. Um, So the discovery items, the things that you want to find or you think are exciting and new are really difficult to see and they have no attention to design from an aesthetic standpoint you know it's dimly lit wood is supposed to communicate natural but it just feels old and outdated Hmm. and usually right yeah there's a way to use it it's not a charming place yeah yeah and sampling is like the extent of how they bring the products to life, you know, slices of chocolate bars and paper cups that they're shoveling right and left in your face. Uh, right. They're not really creating like um, they're not really selling in the way that you would like to be sold to where you actually feel, feel an emotional connection. to a product. Right. Do you have any time to do uh, freelance consulting or you're, you're consumed with this? your primary pop-up grocer business? Yeah, I did both for a while. I mean, I bootstrapped this business. And when I say, I don't even think bootstrap's the right term. I had no money. So this business was um, (laughs) profitable from day one. I never put a dollar in. So I I had to (laughs) kind of straddle the line in in both pools um, or have my toes in both pools for a while. But no, I'm, I'm all in on this. I have, pretty ambitious goals for the future. So as much as I would, I would like to provide consultation to so many brands because now I have a direct line with so many, I, I don't, I don't have the time for it, but we try, we try to help uh, at least one in a very real and impactful way per year through the fund, which is what we set up. We've, we've always given back a percentage of the sales in each of our pop-ups before I even knew we were going to have sales for certain uh to a local charity but now what we do is contribute to again what we call the fund the pop-up grocery fund and through that we give cash and more importantly creative services to an emerging brand and we actually give them a complete rebrand so totally redo their packaging their website and give them like you know a better foot forward for for future success so are there other companies out there that people like me could hire to, to consult like that? Cause I don't, I don't trust anybody. I feel like there's a lot of frauds out there that, you know, use social media as teens and think that they know what they're doing with it. And I haven't really seen it work for people. Like 
obviously I have friends that are influencers. We've gotten to the little bit and level we are through us doing it ourselves. So it's organic, it's authentic, but there's a lot of best practices that I know for sure I'm not using. And I also don't have mm-hmm. the physical time. Are there truly companies out there that, that help? Just even a question. And while I have you here, I'm going to ask yourself a question. You know, my, I've always built myself as a virtual bakery because I do this on the side, but I do it very seriously, like putting out 500 to 1,000 loaves a weekend. Wow. And I do that by not having a permanent location. And in the summer, it's relatively easy because you have farmer's markets around Long Island, especially during COVID. It was, the, it was an essential business and we were allowed mm-hmm. to be open. That's where we started. And it was huge. It was busy. And we were also able to deliver to homes. Now I'm starting to think, do I do pop-ups at other physical locations instead of renting a place? Like all these breweries are happy to host us. Mm -hmm. And then each time you go to a new brewery that has their own following, we could leverage their followers. Yeah. Right. And continue to build this brand. And and I constantly think of myself as a marketer. Because, I mean, people, let's face it, they could buy sourdough bread from a hundred other sourdough makers here in Long Island. Why, yeah. why are they buying mine? Because I'm, I'm trying to tell a story mm-hmm. and I'm trying to touch these people. Mm-hmm. And when I touch them, I want to present it in a certain way. So I, I get it, but you can only grow so much without like figuring out what's the national play or what's mm-hmm. the, how do you touch more people? I'm kind of rambling. <laughs> um, but I, I know, I know it's the marketing. I mean, yeah, well, it's the marketing. And unfortunately, in CPG, at a certain point, it just becomes about um, cash in the bank. CPG, too, please, please. Which I really wish that weren't the case. Please enlighten me. I'm not a business school good Sorry. person. <laughs> neither, heck, neither am I. Um, yeah, neither am I. I looked at I, my Google tab would is not something I would want to show my investors. They would be shocked <laughs> to know what... Uh, what terms I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Just I'm, like all of them. I mean, I, I'm thinking it's related to cost of goods. Am I close? No. <laughs> so CPG is the term for uh, the industry, the industry that you're in. It's a consumer packaged good. So uh-huh. I believe, well, I was going to say, I believe food and beverage makes up the majority of the consumer packaged good industry. And I still probably stand by that, but it also includes beauty. So right. any, any consumable that comes in a package. Um, now the one thing about us to, though, to reach a, we're, we're perishable. So like it's, it's a, it's not, and sure I could probably invest in better packaging, but usually it's being opened and immediately thrown away. It's just, you know what I mean? Which is another reason I don't think we'd even be applicable to your shop or shops which is like also, it. It's also why you can just unfortunately only reach a certain level of growth unless you increase your shelf life i mean i could bore you with the ins and outs of the grocery industry and since you said i could curse why it's uh so fucked up but one critical aspect uh that was really unfortunate for consumers is that we will not be able to eat real food from the grocery store you know without preservatives and all the crap that extends its shelf life until the distribution process, the middleman nature of how the food gets from the manufacturer to the store changes. Because right now there are so many intermediaries. I mean, I I would find it so fascinating to be able to like QR code a map of every product in my pantry and see where it's been and how it's gotten to me. Because it has to go quite a distance over some time, but then when it reaches the shelf, it has to last. So you're already looking at a pretty extended shelf life just because of the time from manufacturer to store. So all of that is to say that like the retailers, they don't want to deal with the finagling of a sort of fussy product, right? They want something that they can put on the shelf and then they can ignore it. So if it's perish highly perishable, then you have to and you and you can't make it more shelf stable, then you have to enter frozen or refrigerated 
And both of those have their own complex challenges in terms of distribution, getting from A to Z, associated costs. Now we're talking about refrigerated trucks. I mean, cold chain is, anyway, like I said, it's just, there's a lot, there's a lot. Um, I, and I like, at I the like, end of the day, I think it's really unfortunate because. I like learning about this. I think it's important at the stage we're in. I don't know. I find it fascinating. If all listeners don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we should. We should care about, I mean, we're so disconnected from where our food comes from. And I'm not like a farm to table eater. I mean, heck, I run a packaged goods store. Uh, I think, you know, the reality is we live in the world that we do. And the best we can do is do the best that we can within the constraints of that. I don't shame myself for not eating something from the farm or, you know, I don't have time to make fresh meals three times a day, but we, we are quite disconnected from where our food actually comes from and why it should cost so much too. I mean, that's the other thing that uh, the typical grocery store has really done a disservice to us in terms of like our expectations that a loaf of bread should be one ninety nine, two ninety nine. like good ingredients cost money cost money to get those things to you oh yeah um my bread and costs, it's unfortunate then that that has to be yeah my bread's between six and twelve dollars a loaf and the people that buy our bread they they're okay with it it's naturally leavened they know they're getting quality they may not buy it some people do buy it every week some people buy it for special occasions some people buy it when they're hosting people and i like that angle i like i like being thought of as the bread that the people go to for special occasions, you know, but then you look at uh, Dave's killer bread and Dave doll is someone I've had on this podcast. That bread's everywhere, but maybe at this point, there's a lot of preservatives in it, you know, maybe, or, or maybe he's gotten to a certain size where he can have a bit more control over that. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, pricing is something that a lot of small brands get wrong from the get-go and that can really kind of screw them over too. If you don't understand well what all of the intermediaries cost and how that will affect the end price for the consumer at retail, you know, if your loaf of bread costs $4 to make and you sell it direct to consumer for $6, that's that's a pretty decent margin and it's a pretty decent fair price to the consumer. But if you have to then sell that to a distributor who has to make money, so they tack on their margin and then that distributor sells it to the retailer and the retailer has a 50% margin, all of a sudden, and if you have a broker in there somewhere, all of a sudden, a $4 loaf of bread, if that's where I started, I can't remember, yeah. <laughs> has very quickly become a 12 or 13 dollar loaf right yeah it's out of, it's out of most people's league it better be a damn good loaf of bread at this point <laughs> damn good yeah <laughs> and then most people don't know how to like well anyway, whole another thing most people don't know how to cook so they don't know how to um elongate or um they don't know how to use a loaf of bread in the time in which it, it perishes maybe they don't even know that you could free you could freeze it yeah uh, my, my friend, I'm, always, I'm consistently shocked. My friend gives out a sheet of paper with those instructions for every loaf he sells. He's a very successful baker out in Los Angeles, and I've since started doing that. You know, they don't know Great. for people whatever reason, it. but yeah, people do need to know that. Some people ask, but most don't. Yeah, people need help. People need help. So, Denver was one of the most recent locations you chose. What goes into picking a city? So because of our model, we go first and foremost where brands that we feature are looking to gain exposure, gain market penetration, build retail relationships, build consumer relationships. So those tend to be major metropolitan cities with health conscious or healthy, you know, health conscious consumers, they're everywhere, but, you know, healthy, active lifestyle they're also hopefully everywhere now predominantly on the coast um east coast mid-atlantic 
West Coast. We haven't really made it to the center of the country yet, but hopefully we will. Cool. Love that. I want to dive a little bit into your writing past. I have researched and found an article that you wrote that I love about. Oh, God. <laughs> do you know what it is? Oh, it's about eating alone. It's about eating alone, isn't it? Yes. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's my, I, 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 I'm recently in a relationship, so I am adjusting to, um, a new amount of time that I have to spend with myself. <laughs> but so I, I will admit I'm not, I'm not as religious about my Thursdays, which I think is a good thing. Uh, I'm learning to be a little bit more flexible. So well, let's tell I'm our listeners here. Still be. Let's tell our listeners here what we're even talking about. You came up with a solo date night yes. experience for yourself. And you, you did this for how long? Yes. Four years. Wow. Or more. Yeah, I would take myself out to dinner every Thursday night quite religiously. And I had a number of rules that surrounded the experience, which mostly just pertained to no distraction. So I wouldn't, I had to check my phone at the door when I entered the restaurant. I would sit at the bar exclusively to allow myself the opportunity to meet someone serendipitously that I wouldn't have otherwise. And no books, no podcasts, <laughs> no consumption other than the, my surroundings and the, the food that I was eating. And the alcohol consumption. And the alcohol consumption, which plenty. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I sell a lot of non-alcoholic beverages, but I, I imbibe myself. Yeah, it was a honestly, it was a wonderful experience, uh, completely transformative. I tell particularly a lot of women who I speak with who continue to be sort of shocked that I would do such a thing, which I still find quite surprising, especially living in a city full of so many independent women, such as New York, to, to go out and, and do it and do it unabashedly. Because uh, it really just teaches you to enjoy spending time with yourself, which is so important important in the journey to love and respect yourself. So. Yeah. You know, when I would go back to LA often and I would spend four days at a time, every month or every other month, I would go out to eat alone a lot. And I didn't, I, I wish I would have read this article. I mean, the idea of choosing where I go based on the fact that they had a good bar to eat at instead of sitting at a table alone, which is what I did a lot, which is incredibly awkward sometimes. Yeah. You know, uh, it used to happen to me specifically a lot in, in Europe, uh, sitting, be, being seated at a table alone because they don't really have a dining at the bar culture. I mean, they're like bars, but there's not really a bar at a restaurant culture. So that feels even more strange sitting at a table by yourself in a foreign country, especially with like red hair. If I'm in Italy, you know, like <laughs> they know I'm not from around here. So I felt like uh, there's a I, spy from alone at the table. From Dublin. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or well, often and I think I included this in the piece, often people would think I was a food critic, which is pretty funny because that would result in like a, a lot of uh pandering to me, giving me good food compliments. <laughs> yeah. I let them believe whatever they wanted to believe about me. Yeah. That's cool. We uh I like sitting at the bar. My wife and I went to a place we had never been about a month ago. And funny enough, we were sitting at the bar and we were chatting up the people next to us. It turned out we knew them from the farmer's markets, but not very well. But we ended up having a great time with them that night. There is something social about eating at the bar, even as a couple or, or friends or something, you know, if you're at the right place. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I've met people. Yeah, I've met people also dining alone. I've met couples, groups. Plenty of bartenders. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been quite a like. I mean, that's what I should write a book about. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Really good. I mean, people would relate to it. There's just so many people that are alone, whether they can't find somebody to be with, or they choose to be alone, or something happened in their life that creates this situation where they are alone, and it's okay to be alone, right? I think it's a great topic. 
I think it's more, I think it's more than it's okay. I think that we should really, I mean, this is what I thought I was going to do before I started pop up grocer was to be like a solo evangelist, which solo for me was different than being single. It was like choosing yourself and it's, it's more than okay. It's like a very fulfilling and rewarding choice. So yeah, I wish people, more people, and again, more women specifically, but, but I understand all, all people didn't feel like it was some kind of consolation prize or like they have to, they have to learn to enjoy being by themselves because no one has chosen them, whether that's romantically or friends wise, or just for the evening. It's like, I think we should all carve out time to choose ourselves over anything else. That's good advice. I love it. Have you had any mentors in life? Officially, no. I've definitely had people that I've looked up to. Um, you know, the founder of Chobani, which is where I really cut my teeth, has taught me so much about what I aspire to do in business, which is ultimately to, to do good. Uh, that's where I got the idea to, you know, give back from day one. Um, but I'm, I'm a, as you now understand from my solo date night experience, I'm quite an independent person. So it, it's a, it's not, uh, doesn't come naturally to me to seek a mentor or to seek anything from anyone. It's also something that I'm working on. But. Got it. But people ask me all the time, like, uh, how to find a mentor. And I, I wish I, it seems like the, that more formal relationship of mentor or mentee is something that a lot of people are interested in identifying and there's maybe not a very clear path to doing I think that. it's different in every situation and depending on your personality and sometimes it's organic sometimes it's calculated but it could be helpful you know like there's something about going back to being naive and jumping into these businesses but at some point like for me at least it's like all right I am glad I didn't know but now I know enough, I need to figure out some, a real plan. Yeah. It was okay to not do this with a business plan. But now, this is getting real. Yeah. And we know enough to go put this thing on paper and figure out what these steps are. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely so. don't access my, my network as much as I should. We're all organisms just growing and... <laughs> learning and growing. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, listen, I appreciate you coming on. I'm looking forward to visiting pop-up grocer in Manhattan. You think it'll be ready by the spring? Oh, definitely. We're planning a winter opening. So Q1. And Q1. It'll, yeah. It's, uh, it's downtown. It'll be, it'll be complete with a cafe baked goods, full coffee bar, limited seating, but definitely a place to come discover, shop, hang, meet people, or come alone. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, we'll be following what's going on and we'll try to help promote it and we'll be down there. Wish you the best of luck with everything and thanks for spending the time with us. Awesome. I can't wait. Thank you so much for having me. You got it. Have a great day. See ya. This episode of Bread for the People was brought to you by Side Hustle Bread, Long Island's handcrafted artisanal bread company. Side Hustle Bread is a family-run business that's bringing the neighborhood feel back to Long Island one loaf at a time. If you like what you're hearing, don't forget to head on over to iTunes and rate and review this episode. Reviewing and rating is the most effective way to help us grow our audience. This episode was produced by Milestone TV and Film. I'm your host, Jim Serpico. Blessed be the bread, everyone. Bread.